So I can see the participants counter going up, but I think I'll literally just wait 10 seconds and then launch into this. Look, 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 how, look how quickly it's rising. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think participants won't be able to actually see this, but you'll just have to take our word for it that it's shooting up. So um, yeah, I'm very, I'm very conscious of the fact that nothing I have to say is worth taking time away from our two speakers today. So I'll just very gradually launch into a gentle introduction. Um, and I'll start just by saying welcome, welcome to this collaborative event, which is being co-hosted by <clears throat> the British Sociological Associations, post-colonial slash decolonial transformations, a study group and Queer Cultures Graduate Research Seminar at the University of Cambridge here at the English Faculty. Um, just by way of introduction slash Zoom fodder, I'll say a few words of introduction about the latter organisation. Um, Queer Cultures is convened by Nisha, uh, Nisha Murphy, uh, Rebecca Anbar and myself. Um, the seminar is committed to thinking about queer and trans studies in the broadest terms, examining the crossing of boundaries, resistance to and transgression of social, sexual and identity norms. Queer cultures is a space to experiment with ideas and readings, to respond to provocations and to think about queer literary cultures in a creative and collegial and sometimes rambunctious manner. Um, I realised the participant list went up a bit while I was saying that, but don't worry if you missed what I just said. Anyone who's just joined, it wasn't that important. I think I can probably hand over to Saskia at this point to um, introduce our panellists and talk about the other co-hosts. Thank you so much, uh, Desmond. Uh, yeah, so I'm just going to quickly introduce the Post and Decolonial Transformation Study Group, which uh, is part of the BSA um, and it's convened by Gaminda Bambra, who is co-hosting today, uh, Megan Tinsley, Ali Megji and myself. And we aim to rethink sociology in the context of historical and in many cases, ongoing processes of colonialism, enslavement and racial capitalism. Um, but moving quickly on, I'm really pleased to introduce our speakers for today. Um, who are Jordi Rosenberg, who is a professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and author of the award-winning novel Confessions of the Fox and forthcoming hybrid work The Day Unravels What the Night Has Woven. Uh, Rahul Rao is a reader in political theory at SOAS, University of London, and the author of the also award-winning Out of Time, The Queer Politics of Postcoloniality, published last year. He is currently writing a book on the politics of controversial statues. Uh, but yeah, so I'm just going to introduce the event and then hand over to Rahul. Um, so for many of us, Confessions of the Fox, which was published in 2018, took on new uncanny resonances last year as the effects of a global plague collided with a steady neoliberalization of the academy. Playfully deconstructing the archive of capitalist modernity Confessions holds out hope for a queer commons of anti-colonial, radical political thought and action. In a similar spirit, Rahul's incisive account of contemporary homo capitalism in Out of Time provides a vital perspective on global imperialist histories and how time and space matter differently in the queer post-colony. Together, Georgie jo and Rahul's writing illustrates how literature provides a space to interrogate the entanglement of colonialism and capitalism. Their work opens up new possibilities for imagining queer post-colonial pasts and futures. Uh, so first we'll hear from Georgie and Rahul, who will have a conversation about their recent work, and then we'll open it up to questions from everyone. Please feel free to use the chat or Q&A function to ask your question, and you're free to send them in whilst our speakers are talking. Uh, over to you, Rahul. Thank you, Saskia, and thanks for the invitation to this um, event. 
Um, I'm so excited. I'm a little bit nervous. So <laughs> um, yeah, just bear with me while I work out where my stuff is. Um, I've been really excited about Confessions of the Fox um, from the very first moment that I picked it up, um, which might have been when it just came out. And then I read it again last year when I was reviewing it um, at the very beginning of the COVID pandemic. And as Saskia just said, it had this uncanny resonance um, reading this book. I'll say a little bit about what kind of book I think it might be. Um, in the middle of a, of a pandemic, at a moment when the university, the academy seemed to be undergoing a process of restructuring um, out of all recognition for some of us. Um, but I want to say three things really about confessions. Um, and I've given them these tentative headings, um, somewhat ill-advised headings maybe. Um, the first is revolutionary jouissance, which is a, probably an ill-advised heading because I don't know enough psychoanalysis to be using that word, but um, it, it, it is the term that I, I wanted to think about when um, I was trying to think about what to say about this book. Um, part of why my mind is very fragmented today, I think, is because of the kinds of news that we're all dealing with in different parts of the world, um, whether that's Palestine, uh, Gaza um, or India with the way COVID is playing itself out there um, or indeed the UK or wherever else people might be. But the one story that really captured my attention in a hopeful way um, over yesterday and today was the story of the thwarted immigration raid in Glasgow, which um, many of you may have heard of. And this is where I want to begin because this was a moment of an extraordinary moment of solidarity in which the extraordinary people of Glasgow Southside thwarted a dawn immigration raid, forcing the authorities to abandon plans to detain two people. Um, hundreds of people seem to have contributed to the effort. If you look at some of the more wide angle videos of the moment of the occupation of the street, you can see just how many people um, were involved. But one man in particular who lay under a van for hours seems to have played a pivotal role in stopping it from moving away um, with the two men. Uh, he's been called Ken Muir Street's van man. And he said a little bit about um, what had led up to that moment um, in a tweet that I think actually Gurminder retweeted, uh, which is how I saw it. Um, he said he was part of Glasgow's No Evictions Network, and, and I'm quoting now from that tweet. He says, it's not often that you catch raids in the act like this, but the South Side has a lot of folks pulling together. Our anarchists look out for our queer communities, our queer communities look out for our migrant communities, and so on. All this began with someone on their way to work spotting an enforcement van and posting it to their Facebook groups. From there, the scenes at 5 p.m. were inevitable. There's something really moving about that, that phrase. From there, the scenes at 5 p.m. were inevitable. I was just buying time for people to get there, but only because our neighborhoods already put in the work to organize and share information. And that's the end of the quote. So the question that this poses for me is what, what is the jouissance of revolutionary solidarity? How does it happen? What does it take to forge it? Do you have to recognize yourself in an other to feel it? What kind of love is this? What does desire have to do with revolution? I don't think political theory has come close to answering these questions, but on some days I've wondered whether a conversation between political theory and fiction and storytelling and magic might do that. And this is where Confessions of the Fox begins to mean so much to me. So for those of you who've read it, Actually, for those of you who haven't read it, um, at the heart of the story is um, the story of a relationship between Jack Shepard, who is the greatest jailbreaker and the most devoted, most thorough caruser of Quim in all of London, we're told at the outset of the, of the book, and Bess Khan, who is part Anglo, part Lascar, um, and um, living in the London of the time. 
So the book is telling us the story of this magical relationship that blooms between Jack and Bess, which is fueled as much by what they find in each other as by their inhabitation of an undercommons that is called forth by the relentless enclosures of their time and place. Confessions of the Fox is as much the story of that undercommons as it is of the blossoming relationship, never ending fuck fest between Jack and Bess. Um, this is the domain of the urban poor and the unruly mob, the gender ambiguous and the wayward, the black and brown detritus of empire that washes up the Thames into the city that is fast becoming the center of the world. Um, I have this slightly irritating tendency when I'm watching a film uh, or, a, or a TV series to fixate on details about sets and costumes um, and accents. And so in this particular case, I, I thought very much about time, maybe predictably because of the book I was writing at the time that I was reading this. Um, it turns out that Bess's story uh, or, or, or Bess comes from a community in the Fens um, and has just witnessed that huge dramatic moment when the Fens are being drained um, and, and communities who live in, in this eastern part of England are displaced as a result of the draining of the Fens. When I looked up this historical moment, I, I learned that the last of this process unfolded somewhere around 1820. So I imagine that this novel, if it has a time and place, and at one level it does because it's very rich in historical detail, if it has a time and place, it's somewhere after the 1820s um, in, in this part of the world, maybe. Maybe Jordi will tell me that that's not quite right, but that's sort of how I was thinking about it as I read. Um, their great nemesis in, in the novel is Jonathan Wilde, the thief catcher in general, whose profiteering protection racket organizes both crime and its punishment. Um, life is nasty, brutish, and short, but one of the extraordinary things about the story of Jack and Bess is that, and this is one of my favorite quotes from the book, um, revelry is the verso face of misery and terror. Um, so this is a story of how one finds desire, how one survives a plague, um, how one is able to live in the midst of a plague with one's desire intact. There is, is an exceptional time marked by the birth of something that we would later call capitalism, by the emergence of the property form and by a certain conception of the body. And all these things are, um, all these things emerge out of the book in, in, a, in, in, in a completely undidactic way, which is I think one of the magical things about it. There are two voices in the book, which for me alert the reader to what's at stake in, in the daring escapades of Jack and Bess and um, the other people who inhabit this queer under commons. The first is Bess herself, who in Jack's telling has a knack for, and I'm quoting Jack's description of Bess here, conducting study at the crosshairs of violence, spinning speculation from wreckage. In other words, theorizing in the midst of the catastrophe. The other theoretical voice in the book, the voice that brings Bess and Jack's story to us in the present is that of Dr. R. Vaught, um, frustrated academic in the neoliberal university. I wonder to myself, what other kind is there? Um, when in one of its characteristic gestures of contempt for the humanities, the university decides to empty the upper floors of its library to make space for swish offices for administrators, Voth chances upon the lost memoirs of the legendary Jack Shepard. In a significant departure from the then known archive of Shepardiana, this particular text seems to suggest that Jack was assigned female at birth. And this remarkable insinuation sets Voth, himself a trans person, on a frenzied project of annotation that he thinks might culminate in the production of a text to rival in importance the memoirs of Herculine Varbin in the Annals of Transgender History. What begins as a labor of love, even survival, is quickly co-opted by the ever watchful university in the person of Dean of Surveillance, um, Andrews. Hauled up for improperly utilized leisure hours, Voth is presented with a choice between being placed on unpaid leave and producing a text that will be marketed as the earliest authentic confessional transgender memoirs known to history. For those of us used to having meetings with our line managers about unpaid leave or about our ref submissions, all of this is astoundingly familiar. And so this is the other level of uncanniness, I think, um, on which um, I uh, read the book. 
So my second sort of heading or things I want to think about, um, and here, this is where I don't know enough about Marxism to be suggesting this, but is the commodity form. So the text to be published um, that, that um, Vought wants to publish is to be published by a company called Pequod, with which the university has recently partnered, which also has interests in pharmaceuticals. Pequod and the university want to release the text in conjunction with the launch of a new pharmaceutical product, an organic, humane, bioidentical, open source testosterone produced from the urine of cows owned by the university. So this is where we begin to think about testosterone as a commodity. One of the great joys of watching this relationship that develops between Jack and Bess is in observing how each sharpens the dissident sensibilities of the other. Um, Bess coaxes, even taunts Jack out of his deference to the law. It turns out that Bess has both the analysis and the guts, but Jack has this magical ability to hear the stories that commodities want to tell. They call out to him, um, and, and this is a quote from, from a really, to me, special moment in the book. They call out to him, bawling out their miserable biographies, their wants, their needs, their histories and travels, the entire crowded consecutions of labor, exchange and fraud congealed in them. A Marxist before Marx. I thought about this phrase because again, I was thinking about time. When is all of this set? The first volume of Capital appears in 1867. And these characters, I think, lived before that, somewhere in 1820 or 1830. Um, and that's quite important to me because it seems to be saying that Marx, the theorist, yes, is important, but these ideas are somehow, they have a life outside of him and before him. Um, it reminds me of the ways in which some third world Marxists have tried to demonstrate that their societies exemplified a kind of proto-communism that made them ripe for communism when it finally arrived as political ideology. So this Marxist before Marx, Jack Shepard, orally, because he's able to listen to the commodities, pierces the veil of commodity fetishism. We encounter several of the commodities that one might expect to find in Imperial London, muslin, indigo, coffee, tea, sugar. But the commodity that is most pivotal to the narrative is a mysterious elixir, originally concocted by a society of maroons in the Java Sea. And the reference to maroons is also really significant and important here. The elixir was produced from pig urine through a complex and elaborate process that relied on the collective knowledge of a community now all but destroyed. What is remembered is the delightfully emboldening and bulking effect it had on all who consumed it. It's not called testosterone because testosterone is first synthesized and given a name or that name in 1935. I want to ask Jordan, uh, I want to ask Jordi about his love affair with Marx's capital. Um, the blurb for his forthcoming book, The Day Unravels What the Night Has Woven, reads, I enter on her deathbed, rewrites Karl Marx's magnus opus, magnum opus, Liberties Are Taken. This is a hybrid work of fiction and nonfiction. I, I also found myself thinking here about Jordi's extraordinary essay, Gender Trouble on Mother's Day, which is about his experience of first reading Gender Trouble. And I wondered about what an analogous piece on his experience of reading and countering and experiencing capital might, might have looked like. Um, when it comes to the commodity form, the commodity that we're thinking about most in, in this um, text and also in a piece that Jordi wrote for Salvage is testosterone. And in that piece, Jordi asks, what dispossessions have turned the natural resource of testosterone into an exchangeable commodity? He takes us through the sordid contortions of early modern English penal discourse that justified the use of incarcerated bodies as raw materials for the production of scientific knowledge and the use of labor to transform territory into raw material, ultimately making possible 20th century testicular experimentation on the incarcerated in the search for virilizing remedies. Um, he notes that testosterone has a tendency to be seen as hypercapacitating the body and asks, what guarantee is there that it will always capacitate in ways that contribute to a radical project? No guarantee. Molecules in, them, in themselves do not do political things. And so he locates gendered embodiment in something beyond molecules and really beyond the self. 
uh, it's a reminder that the history of the body is not reducible to what is injected into it. And so this thinking about the body leads me to the question of genre, and this is where I'll end. There were several moments in which I found myself wondering about the genre of Confessions of the Fox. And I imagine many readers have asked this question. Is it a novel? Is it a manifesto disguised as a novel? Is it a work of queer theory? Is it a work of historical fiction? All of the above. But then I began to wonder about my own demand for genre intelligibility. Why did it matter what genre this was? I began to think of my demand for genre intelligibility as in some way as problematic as the demand for bodies to be intelligible. One of the striking things about confessions is that against the grain of all of the sexology, such as it is of the time, none of the protagonists have any interest in describing Jack Shepard's anatomy. It's a defiant narrative gesture, a kind of collective refusal of the demand for intelligibility that is just incredibly powerful. So you don't need to know what this book is. You just need to know that it's a kind of magic. Um, I'll stop there. Uh, should I just go ahead? Thank you, Rahul. That's um, too generous of a reading of the novel. Um, I'm excited to talk with you. Um, after I give this presentation of my own. I wanna begin by acknowledging that the land that I'm speaking from today is the original homeland of the Nanatuk. I acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from this territory and respect and honor the many indigenous people still connected to this land. I wanna thank the organizers of the Queer Culture Seminar at Cambridge for their labor in putting together this Zoom event and for their perseverance as students and workers and thinkers during this very difficult time. And finally, I wanna acknowledge the real contradiction of being very grateful to see you, Rahul, and connect and talk over these spatial distances and the strangeness, kind of to echo what you said a bit, of doing anything at all over Zoom in the context of the absolute devastation of the world, especially uh, now in India, in Palestine, and of course, always here in the US, still under an occupation that began in 1607. Uh, it feels very strange to be talking at all. We all wanna be out in the streets, I think, uh, laying under vans. So um, I'll just get right to it. <laughs> There's so much to say about Rahul's extraordinary work out of time. And in many ways, I'm not able to engage with a great deal of the specifics around the Ugandan or Indian contexts, And I don't wanna to pretend to be literate in a field of scholarship that I'm not trained in. I will say that I learned so much from Rahul's book and I hope I can engage as a layperson and a fan of his argument in some useful way. As a literary scholar, um, that way in which I'll engage will eventuate in some kind of interpretive offering around how we might find our cultural studies undergirded by some of the arguments that Rahul makes. In many ways, his work is primed to support literary study because of his fine-grained attention to that Marxist problematic of mediation that runs through the book. One example of this might be his elucidation of the strange ease with which homophobia can become articulated in, in Stuart Hall's sense with either position in, quote, the imperialism, anti-imperialism binary over the course of Uganda's post-colonial history, end quote. To this question of the valence shifting of homophobia, Rahul argues for a view of sexuality as the terrain or ground of struggle rather than a substantive value integral to the essence or identity of place, that's a quote. In Rahul's poetic and erudite framework, the political rhetoric of homophobia is something like a vanishing mediator, suturing different political formations together provisionally, naturalizing that suture, and then slipping off to naturalize a contradictory formation. This attention to mediation, I think, is a driving force in the book and is one of the tools Rahul uses to clarify the political landscape, not for its own sake, but in order that the reader might better understand where to take up alliances and positions. This means for one thing, the development of the concept of homonationalism. As what he calls a quote, supplement to Jaspir Poir's concept of homonationalism, 
quote, homo capitalism signifies the folding into capitalism of some queers and the disavowal of others through a liberal politics of recognition that obviates the need for redistribution. Selective inclusion widens rifts between queers deemed productive and unproductive, while also threatening to evacuate the anti-capitalist potential of queer movements themselves. The introduction of the concept of homo capitalism allows us to more accurately describe political conjunctures in places where the homo nationalist frame is not dominant, as well as within those places. As Jaspir described it in her wonderful conversation with Rahul at the Queering Authoritarians Conference, to which I would refer people um, as a very important uh, discussion they had, quote, homo nationalism is foremost a theory of US racial formation, a disciplining of US subjects in relation to M US empire, a dual movement of incorporation and abjection that instrumentalizes the discourses and affects of American exceptionalism. Its most efficacious employment and its most important effect is to excuse, minimize, and deflect from queer phobia in the US, end quote. So to be completely reductive in the interest of time, where in the US, homo nationalism was originally refined as a concept in relation to the efflorescence of, F, uh, or really excrescence of Islamophobia and rabid folding into the nation of, large, of white, largely ruling class queers accompanying the war on terror post 9-11. For Rahul, there's an interest in delineating what he calls the shifting status of same-sex desire in the national imaginary at different historical and locational junctures sometimes becoming a signifier of resistance to imperialism and other times being seen to be an expression of it. For example, Rahul makes clear that while a homo-nationalist framework vaunts the equation of tolerance for homosexuality with liberal modernity, this framework becomes complicated in an Indian context where, for example, and he describes the Nalsa decision endorsing, quote, the demand of trans persons, this is 2014, for recognition as a category of socially and educationally backward citizens. It's a direct quote from the, from the legal language, entitling them to constitutional guarantees of affirmative action in public employment and education. So Rahul says, against the presumption in much of the literature on homonationalism that modernity is the primary temporal vehicle for queer legitimation, my reading of the Nalsa judgment suggests that in the Indian context, both tradition and modernity have been deployed as legitimating strategies to render different kinds of queer embodiment and desire intelligible in a juridical register. And it's the juridical register that I'm gonna spend a little time on now. Meanwhile, in the juridical bowels of the global North, the embrace of homosexuality as an alibi for neocolonialism rages on. In a quite magisterial chapter of Out of Time on specters of post-colonialism, Rahul analyzes the otherwise unaccountable atonement of British parliamentary officials for the criminalization of homosexuality by the British in former colonies. Quote, in October 2012, the conservative peer Lord Lexton offered a categorical statement of British responsibility for laws criminalizing homosexuality in many parts of the world. Um, quote, we must remember where the laws criminalizing homosexuals in many countries came from. They came from Britain, which alone among the European empires of the 19th century possessed a criminal code under which homosexuals faced severe penalties just for expressing their love and physical desire for one another. Similar sentiments, Rahul shows, were expressed in a debate on global LGBT rights held in the House of Commons in October 2017. On this occasion, Lloyd Russell Moyle, Labour MP for Brighton Kemptown, went further in thinking through the implications of this, quote, special responsibility, taking the view that the United Kingdom had an obligation to weigh in, quote, because we were the ones that historically imposed some of these laws. He insisted we have a duty to be proactive in our response. And what proactive means um, basically uh, subjecting other countries to uh, international financial instruments. In a chapter too thorough and expansive to condense here, Rahul wants to think about why it is that British parliamentarians are so quick to apologize and seek to atone for the crimes of homophobia while utterly foreclosing atoning in any material way for the Atlantic slave trade. Uh, there's another quote from Rahul. Cameron's incipient articulation of what we might think of as gay conditionality, in other words, making the, the conditioning of aid 
uh, sorry, making aid conditional on um, certain like anti-homophobic provisions, Cameron's incipient articulation of gay conditionality betrays a desire for control and the delusions of omnipotence that are characteristics of manic reparation. Perhaps this rare expression of atonement for colonialism has been forthcoming precisely because it is thought to furnish the requisite standing for a moral crusade in which the United Kingdom can assert leadership in the form of immiserating structures of privatization, lot of in international financial instruments. But Rahul is not simply pointing out the hypocrisy of these neo-colonial ventures, but rather reading what needs necessarily to be elided in order to articulate these ventures as a form of atonement. Um, another quote, juxtaposing conversations about what he describes as the sexual and racial legacies of colonialism, Rahul argues that, quote, an implicit metonymy between queerness and whiteness in the imaginary of the British political elite fuels the discourse of atonement for colonial anti-sodomy laws, end quote. I wanna pick up on this work that he's doing around comparative atonements via a turning to the legal framework of the counterfactual enshrined in the law, as Stephen Best has argued in Plessy versus Ferguson, in which the false equivalence of separate but equal laws creates the legal necessity of envisioning hypothetical parallel worlds. Uh, <clears throat> kind of building a bit on Best's work, Catherine Gallagher has argued that the structure of the counterfactual became enshrined as a principle of international law in the Nuremberg trials, which generalized the legal principle of restitution for injury. By this logic, legal compensation is sought for an alternate present, which was meant to have happened, but for the offending action, i.e. the plaintiff would have been expected to lead a certain kind of life if the defendant hadn't hit them with their car. Thus, legal restitution is, 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 uh, is, is uh, meant to be equivalent to a lost alternate present. For Gallagher, this logic is generalized after World War II, when individuals began to be able to seek legal restitution from states for compensation against alter, alternate foreclosed futures. Further, the rise of the US as an imperial power after World War II generalizes the alternate history scenario still more broadly into a principle of statecraft through the rise of computer software and wargaming as a means of calculating outcomes and strategy. The legal scholar Robert Westley uh, argues that, quote, in the case of reparations specifically for slavery, the historical counterfactual necessary for recognition of black restitutionary rights, namely that slavery, albeit legal, was a wrongful infringement on the rights of free persons, runs counter to norms of accountability and temporality embedded within the law. The legal norm at variance with this counterfactual posits that since slavery was legal, persons of African descent used as slaves had no rights in their own persons or their labor, end quote. So because under law, persons of African descent were not considered to be able to possess the value of, of themselves as persons, nor to possess objects, quote, this is Wesley again, Compensation to the enslaved, therefore, entails not mere abolition, but a fundamental social revaluation of object, objects of commerce as subjects, a social transformation in which those same subjects are viewed as persons entitled to restitution and recognition of human rights, and not least of all, an appreciation of the exploitative dimension of slavery over time. So it's only through the foreclosure of the possibility of reparations to persons of African descent by an adherence to their legal devaluation of, under the system. In other words, the British system in the present continues to adhere to the legal devaluation of persons of African descent under the system of African slavery. And it's only through the foreclosure of the possibility of reparations that the question of reparations to queerness as whiteness and queerness as a potentially value producing subject is even possible to be raised. This is I think what Rahul is showing. So as Rahul says, the indispensability of Western intervention as an attempt to mitigate the damage wrought by earlier civilizing missions is, an, is I'm, I'm arguing an attempt to activate the value producing potential of whiteness as metonymized in queerness. So Rahul again, the segregation of analytics of sexuality and race 
permits an elision of queerness with whiteness at home that operates on several levels. That is to say, we can only make sense of the otherwise inexplicable elite conservative British mourning for the victims of colonialism in the developing world if we understand it as the runoff or remainder of tears shed for the injured white queer. And this uh, figuration of um, the runoff or remainder of tears shed for the injured white queer really stuck with me. And in, um, in closing this, I wanted to kind of try to speak to a little bit uh, a little bit what I think that figure's doing in Ruckel's work and what that kind of figuration can do for us um, in reading other texts. So the figure of neo-colonial state and capital formation as the runoff of bodily effluvia touches, I think, on an affective circuit that is very old. I'm not talking just about the cultures of 18th century sensibility in which men of capital expressed merit, so-called merit worthiness through the performance of feeling. Rather, I mean specifically the recycling of the West's own sadism into a mechanism of profit production, a metabolic circuit, if you will, where colonizing bodies and their effluvia become the fantasized location of repair for the damages caused by colonialism, past and present. So I wanna make reference here to um, something that has obsessed me for years, which is Richard Ligon's 1657 uh, documents, The True and Exact History of Barbados. Um, in this uh, otherwise somewhat um, textbook example of a, a kind of like um, settler uh, and, and colonialist um, uh, like botan botanical, you know, um, cataloging document. In, in, this, in this work, um, I hesitate to call it a work, in this vile text that still exists and has been enshrined in archives, the stakes of settler excrescence make an unmasked appearance. In the course of a typical colonialist description of the flora of the island of Barbados, um, Ligon, and in particular, the complexities of battling what Ligon represents as the encroachments on agricultural land, on cleared agricultural land of the guava tree, Ligon inserts a strange theatrical tangent in the form of an eavesdropped conversation between a planter father and daughter. The seeds of the guava tree, says Ligon, quote, have this property that when they have passed through the body, uh, when they've been digested, wherever they are laid down, they grow. So, you, okay, I don't need to explain that. The problem uh, for Ligon is that cows eat the seeds and then drop them freely everywhere. In other words, messing up the cleared agricultural land. And then Ligon describes himself eavesdropping this conversation between a planter and an eminent man on the island, seeing his daughter by chance about her natural business called to her, plant even daughter, plant even, meaning like shit in rows, if you're gonna shit, I guess. She answered, if you don't like them, remove them, father, remove them. So a very bizarre scene. Um, what the Barbados document stages is a something really weird and disturbing, but also the fantasized capacity of colonizing bodies to repair the problems produced by colonialism. I'm thinking in particular here of the phenomenon knows, known to Marxists as metabolic rift, or the disruption of the metabolic relation to nature through many things, including, including prominently the increasing distance between sites of consumption and sites of production. This distance causes many problems, most famously the non-return of waste products to the site at which they're produced and thus soil exhaustion, and Marx was obsessed with this. Um, but also, as we can see here, the complete alteration of the landscape such that native shrub becomes, quote, invasive as it encounters the new terrain of colonial cleared uh, pasture land. With the trans, uh, and I want to quote Jason Moore, who we can argue with Jason Moore's conclusions, but this is just a, a quick redaction on metabolic rift. He says, with the transition to capitalism, a new division of labor between town and country took shape on a world scale and within regions, whereby the products of the countryside, especially but not only in the peripheries, 
flowed into the cities, which were under no obligation to return the waste products to the point of production. Nutrients were pumped out of one ecosystem in the periphery and transferred to another in the core. In essence, the land was progressively mined until its relative exhaustion fettered profitability. At this point, economic contraction forced capital to seek out and develop new ways of exploiting territories hitherto beyond the reach of capital. This process moved forward by various combinations of primitive accumulation and market coercion in roughly cyclical fashion, which at the level of the world economy spurred on rapid increases in emigration and the colonization of foreign lands, which were thereby converted into settlements for growing the raw material of the mother country. In the case of Ligon's text, this is all dramatized as a struggle between the cattle who plant freely and the daughter who's cast as a more regulatable worker in the, in the shitting department than a cow with enslaved labor having been entirely elided. In the weird edible triangle of father, daughter, and cow that takes the place of the elision of plantation labor, the problem of metabolic rift is solved by the colonizer's own metabolism. I think there's more to say about the staging of this encounter as a ludic and lewd incestuous interaction and about the contraction of productive and reproductive labor in the white family. But for now, I think we can just simply read the triply voyeuristic scene of the settler daughter's fecund excrescence as articulating with some unnerving exactitude an ideological kernel that becomes uniquely legible under the lens of Rufo's book, which returns us to the scene whereby Western capital makes productive through the colonizer's bodily effluvia tears, in this case, the damage it itself wreaks. I say tears because of Rahul's image of the tears as waste product, as runoff of an affective circuit of production. But the question of anality is here too, of course. It cannot help but be when we're talking about the productivity of homo capitalism. Indeed, what Rahul's book describes is the explicitation of productivity itself, the fantasy of its complete hiving off from the field of reproduction in the white queer subject of capital who then repairs the ills of capital itself. To put a finer point on a point that is perhaps fine enough already, what we're talking about is the replacement of the reproductive familial circuit of Ligon's imaginary with its incestuous play on agriculture as toilet training and the spectacular display of the reach of the patriarchal gaze with the productive circuit of queer homo capitalist subjects whose value is precisely in the incorporation by neo-colonial state and capital of queer formerly perverse anality slash productivity. Um, speaking about the trope of queer subjectivity as capitalism's dystopian fantasy of a subject and social order for whom and for which the realm of reproduction is held at arm's length or permanently suspended. Um, and here we could talk about service work and the outsourcing of reproductive labor and the implication of Rahul's work for an analysis of that at, uh, at the scale of the international division of labor. Um, now here I wanted to end with a suggestive clip uh, from the pilot uh, Years and Years, which is kind of a counterfactual narrative of, of itself, a kind of alternate present, but um, I, I tested it out and I wasn't able to do so. I guess I'll just say, oh, wait, Desmond's found it. Well, I've talked for too long already. I guess I just wanna say that I think this clip actually brings together a kind of apex scene of the merging of homo nationalism and homo capitalism, but I don't know that I have time to show it. Um, but Desmond is, oh, okay. Desmond has found the clip. So should I then just, oh, gee. all right, fine. It's one more paragraph, I'll continue. Um, it's half a paragraph. Um, if anyone here has seen the, the show, Years and Years, it's a British science fiction alternate present series, which follows in its pilot episode, an Anglo-British gay man who manages a council cap camp, and he has a particular passion for container housing. In early scene, we see him gruffly telling a white female coworker about his troubles getting refugees not to bring in too much stuff. He says, you know, they can't bring in so much stuff. These aren't homes, they're emergency housing. I think this distinction between homes and housing is actually the core of, becomes for this show, the core of a gay fantasy that you might, or a gay man might live in a space that doesn't require the labor of an upkeep of the home, that it is housing in which the labor of reproduction is outsourced. Um, at some point, Daniel also says, I could talk about container housing all day. Later in the episode, 
Daniel gives a ride to an Afro-Caribbean neighbor who tells him she's a storyteller for a living and that people need stories in some kind of affective, indescribable way. She makes essentially a very condensed argument for the necessity of reproductive labor and the extension of it beyond the domestic sphere proper. There's too much to say about this completely banana show, but in it, Trump is elected for a second term and sets off a potential World War III by bombing China, and Britain goes into war footing. As this is building, um, Daniel begins to realize that he's in love with Victor, a refugee at the camp who's fled homophobia in the Ukraine, and there's one scene then with them sitting together with a crowd of other refugees holding hands sort of like children while Daniel has brought in the Afro-Caribbean female neighbor to read to all of them. And so this I think is a scene of, again, the kind of outsourcing of reproductive labor. And I think I do wanna count like reading to, like reading to children, reading to, is a form of teaching, it's a pedagogy, and it's a form of reproductive labor. And this is where they, the two, the white gay man and um, Victor, this kind of orientalized refugee from Ukraine who's needed to flee to Ukraine's homophobia, kind of realize that they're in love in this triangle. Um, Shortly after this, the nuclear bomb flies over Britain and Daniel leaves his marital home to fly to the arms of Victor where they finally manifest the kind of both homo-nationalist and homo-capitalist fantasy of gay male sex within this container, which finally realizes its, you know, show given destiny of being a scene in which you could like say, fuck, but never have to do housework or never have to do any form of reproductive labor. Um, and this kind of fantasy that housing might just be for pro the productivity of a kind of the, the recuperation of a kind of gay male anal productivity in the service of the nation. But you'll have to watch the clip to see the, the rightness of my reading of this or, or, or to dispute it. Um, well, that's it, that's all I have. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Jordi, and so much, uh, Rahul. Um, like, I don't know if you want to answer some of the questions that you posed at each other in your talks, um, if that is appealing to either of you. Um, um, I just want to thank you, Jordi, for that really rich set of comments. Um, you've made me think about things in the book that I don't think I thought about as much while writing it, which um, is um, which feels a bit extraordinary. But I, I love this discussion of um, the effluvia and the the way you picked up on the the runoff and the remainder to think about the ways in which the effluvia becomes a kind of site of fantasized repair, as you put it. Um, and I wondered if you would relate this in some way to Lockean theories of property, because so much of Locke's conception of property seems to rest on a kind of mixing of labor with the land, mixing of the body with the land. There's a kind of metabolic, um, there's, a, there's a, I don't want to say metaphor because I think in some sense it's meant quite literally, but, um, I wonder if shitting in, in your account becomes a way of effecting this mixture of the self with the land and thereby claiming ownership of it. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if, if, if that's one direction in which maybe to take this. Yeah, sadly, I'm like obsessed with this and, and yes, I have thought about it. <laughs> I completely agree with you. Thank you for that comment. I mean, it does, you know, it relates, uh, and I think what you're picking up on is that Lockean principle that, you know, it's it's not just that. Um, I mean, many people are familiar with the uh, with the Lockean concept of possessive individualism that was used to seize land in 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 the in the Americas on the rationale that it's not being used properly, and that if you labor on it properly in a British way, then you can claim the use of it. But, you know, I mean, our, our, our mutual friend um, and interlocutor, Brenna Bandar, makes 
you know, this argument very explicitly in her book, uh, The Colonial Lives of Property, that it's not just through the use of the land, but it's through the declaration of the land as waste, as wasteland, first of all, that it becomes propertizable, but also talks quite a bit about these fantasies, particularly in the settler colony, particularly in Palestine, as you know, for example, where um, the, the emphasis on, yes, on the, the, the sweat and soil mixing together of the settler is the way in which A, the settler is indigenized and B, the way in which the land is propertized. So yeah, I, I, and I was obsessed with this question actually throughout the writing of the novel, um, in, but it was in particular around the, the development of the sewer system in London, where these open sewer systems, which I think if you look at 18th century documents, people were horrified by them for a lot of reasons, not really that they were they were used to them. They, it wasn't like a horror that it was suddenly gross. It was the horror was that um, food that was being produced in the countryside that would normally be returned as fertilizer was just go was becoming actually now juridically waste in the sewer and um, not usable. And so I actually was really just interested in writing a novel that was tracking the relationship again between the countryside and the city um, as, you know, this like um, this painful circuit and th these painful kind of um, disconnections and disruptions. Um, I don't want to say too much because I just said really a lot, um, but I, I am curious to hear Rahul speak to any other aspects. I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious now to think about how, you know, the implications of your work for thinking about reproductive labor. And I don't know if, you know, this idea of like white queers as, especially Turing, the work that you do with Turing as this, he's so recuperable for the British because he's so productive, right? And so again, the, the white queerness as this um, almost like just violent fan fantasy of endless productivity um, without ever having to worry about um, um, certain questions of reproduction, or that's a fantasy anyway. I'm gonna... Yeah, the, the Turing um, example is interesting, I think. Um, and I got interested in Turing uh, just for people who haven't read the book, because in, in a sense, the, the, um, the, the, the apology uh, to Alan Turing was something that was unfolding contemporaneously with the parliamentary debates around um, atonement for anti-sodomy laws that uh, Jordi described from the book. Um, Turing is a kind of larger than life figure in the British queer imaginary. And um, I think the reason for that is, is really overdetermined. It's not just that he's white, it's also that he performs a kind of unimpeachable loyalty to the British state as, as playing this integral uh, role in the, in the war effort. Um, he is, of course, a cisgendered man. Even by the standards of 1950s Cheshire, he was given a, a kind of plea bargain deal that other people ensnared in those same laws were not. Um, and, and so without in any way minimizing the suffering that he underwent, um, I think this is a way of um, sort of thinking about what these what these iconic figures do to the contemporary queer imaginary, whether it's Turing or Oscar Wilde or Genet or Harvey Milk or whoever. Um, I think for me and my argument, one of the things that these figures did was they narrowed the gap between the atoners and the atoned for. Um, they, they enable a kind of identification between political elites and, and the constituencies that they um, claim to be atoning for. Uh, and that there is no parallel with the slavery atonement debates where the gap between uh, the, the, those who are called upon to atone and those for whom the atonement is, is due, um, that gap remains as, as wide as it's ever been, um, arguably, it's widening under our current, uh, in our current political conjuncture. Yeah, 
Yeah, Saskia, I don't know what if you if if there are questions we should take or I should try to speak to anything that Rahul brought up or what. Um, why don't you? Uh, yeah, please, please do respond um, to Rahul and then yeah, you know, just invite the audience to uh, put your questions in the chat or the Q and A. Um, yeah, I think we had one hand earlier, which I have noted, but um, yeah. Um, well, if there are, right, okay, well, I don't want to, uh, maybe I'll just, I'm just, uh, I'll just talk while we're, <laughs> while we're waiting for, see if there are any questions. I mean, um, I really loved, you know, I, I, I was so um, honored by, by Rahul's generous reviewing of this book at all, and then this really beautiful description of encountering it, I think, um, maybe, you know, maybe the most useful thing to say is I really like this concept of revolutionary jouissance. I mean, it's very, I don't know if that's homo romantic in um, which would be uh, Rahul's term. Um, I think I was also very interested just in this question of like the temporality of radicalization, like long processes of radicalization. And then there's sometimes, I mean, and it's easier to stage in a novel, um, kind of moments that can affect certain kinds of shifts in consciousness. And, you know, revolutionary consciousness is something that's very hard to talk about in academic work, especially around the kind of like remaindering of Lukács, for example, and, and some of the questions that are attached to Lukácsian um, analysis. So we don't really talk about consciousness at all. Um, really in, in um, I guess, in the US. So, um, I, fiction kind of becomes a place for that. Um, I, I, yeah. And then as to the question of the fens, I guess I would just say, so I had to play with dates because none of these dates actually, this is why it's like speculative fiction. Um, the drain of the fens began in the 17th century. And, but because a, there were such successful, there were many successful resistance movements to it. At one point, um, uh, they were called Fen Tigers, was one set of um, indigenous to the area. Um, people who were mounting resistance, they stopped production on the draining of the fence for five years. Um, but also because capitalists are so ultimately um, foolish about and don't know anything about anything really, um, they would like basically ruin their own project. So they drain out the fens and then the, the, the land, the peat would dry and it would drop and then the water would come back in. So it actually took them like more than a hundred years to actually drain the fens. So um, again, fiction allows us to um, compress these things and to put into narrative relation and to, to kind of gesture at in those kind of Marxist totalizing ways, things that you'd have to argue differently. So really Bess's story should take place in the 17th century and Jack's takes place in the early 18th. Um, I couldn't change the dates on Jack because he was a known figure. Um, Bess, they like has really dropped out of the historical record. Um, and I, I, I had to play with the dates, but there was a little bit more space because because that Fen resistance went on for so long that you could kind of place her in, in time differently. But really what I was interested in showing was again, this metabolic relationship between the dispossession of the countryside and then the, the urbanization of the cities and um, the birth of consumer culture and then the onslaught of laws that get put into place to um, enshrine private property, but... Um, can I can I ask you a question, Jordi? About um, one of the things that really intrigued me was um, Bess's lascarness and just this image of London as a city inhabited by black and brown people, which is very striking in in the book. Um, and this this seems significant to me because if we're talking about you know, when we read or when I read Marx, I feel like the first acknowledgments of colonialism come in his writing on the Irish question. Um, and that happens much later. It happens in the in the newspaper articles and in the correspondence and, you know, what Kevin Anderson calls Marx at the margins. And yet what you give us here is this 
this proto-Marxism, a Marxism before Marx, which is inhabited and practiced and populated by the colonized. Um, and, and I find that a really powerful, it's an image I really want to hold on to. Uh, and I wondered if you could speak to that a little bit and what maybe what you were thinking, whether that's grounded on a kind of historical project or is it is it part of the speculative theoretical desire that you wish for Marxism? I mean, so um, thank you for that question. I mean, there's the very basic question that if anyone who works on the 18th century is going to write a novel about the 18th century, they would know that no, all the historical fiction that represents London as a white city at the time is just inaccurate. So um, because the best character in terms of the actual archival record, so little was known because interracial marriage was not illegal at this point in time, I guess I, I tried to to kind of like do the deductive leap backwards that there's no reason to think that she wouldn't have been. Um, or why did she have to have been white in, in all the sort of retellings and Brecht and in gay. But, but there also was just like, to me, I wasn't even working with Marx so much with this book so much as the, the real like Marxist Bible, I think on a certain level, I'll, I'll retract this later, but with Leinbaugh and, and Peter Leinbaugh's work on the law in the 18th century. And really the question is, you know, if you really want to ask the Marxist question about the birth of private property, what you're really asking a question about is the birth of policing, because the policing comes into shape to protect private property and to naturalize private property, um, it, at least in, in Britain in large part, but it takes place um, and it takes shape at these border zones it, 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 with sort of um, private dock, dock policing concerns. So, I mean, I think there were just a lot of things swimming around in my head around this um, wanting a character, I guess, who, who, I guess this is gonna sound very standpoint oriented, I guess, but who knew more than Jack, who was able to totalize the world more than Jack. And I guess I, my feeling was like, what did she need to know to be able to do that? Um, and I felt like somehow I needed to make it so that she knew the world of the docks and that she knew the countryside. Um, and so um, I think maybe out of that was born this sense that um, a character who would be able to know all of that would have to be this character. Um, um, thank you so much. I mean, I kind of, um, just want to hear you talk to each other forever, but I am also aware that there are questions in the chat. So, um, Desmond, you've got a hand raised and do you want to unmute yourself or do you want me to re read your question? You can unmute yourself. I actually, I actually, it's, I've got a different question. <laughs> um, so we talked a bit about, I'm unmuted, right? I'm not on mute still. This is not me humiliating myself, but you can hear me. Yeah, okay. For, um, you talked a bit about Locke and you talked a bit about Marx and another um, early thinker that comes up in Confessions of the Fox is, of course, Bernard Mandeville. Uh, I have to say, I think it's probably not only the first representation of Mandeville in literary fiction, but also will stand as the best because I just think you couldn't have nailed that character any any more closely than you did. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if not everyone maybe knew so much about Mandeville, but if I recall correctly, Mandeville wrote um, The Fable of the Bees, which is subtitled um, Private Vices, Public Benefits. This is not a very um, theoretically intricate question. I'm just thinking, is, is that a prototype for homo capitalism? This, could we read Fable of the Bees as setting the stage for this idea that um, what's considered a private vice is not only acceptable, but in fact desirable and um, to be encouraged if it's generating um, um, wealth capital to circulate, which is I think if I I'm, never thought this text would ever come in handy and it's been two years since I was compelled to read it for my masters, but maybe um, jo I, Jordi, if you can have it maybe more fresh in your mind, can you, can you have a response to that very blunt question? 
No, I, I'm kind of curious what Rahul has to say. I think that's actually fascinating. That's a fascinating connection to kind of bring it back to the bourgeois political economists. I mean, it's a, I don't know, I don't know the scene that Rahul is describing well enough to say, you know, is, is it operating through a, a, a logic of bourgeois political economy rather than through kind of an understanding of value production in a Marxian vein? I mean, I, I, uh, I guess I, I'm gonna have to leave this to Rahul, but I think it's an amazing Sorry, I got a bit distracted with the chat and I'm not sure I know enough about Mandeville to answer that question. Um, That's okay, I don't either. Like I, <laughs> I hardly know anything about it, to be honest. Just, thought, just popped into my head really as we're talking about it. Um, but yeah, there's questions in the chat, so maybe we can just move on from that. Um, yeah. We've got a comment saying the police in the UK came about as a way to police sex work in public spaces. Cops always anti foyer, fuck the police, which I feel like deserves a read up. Um, and also in relation to that, Misha, I mean, do you want to unmute yourself or should I just read your question? Nope. Okay, uh, Nisha says, uh, Rahul, given your interest in statues, what were your thoughts on the current landscape of policing in the UK? In thinking about the image from a recent Kilda Bill protest where the police surrounded the statue of Churchill. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts actually. Um, I mean, it's so striking that the, the bill proposes penalties for desecration of uh, statues that are incredibly draconian, and you've got to wonder what that's about. I'm, I've also been thinking about um, cows in India. So um, the you know, we have this fascist government that whose policies have literally brought on this most current wave of COVID. Um, and in the midst of this, you hear stories about um, how the health minister is having press conferences um, in which he is urging people to do more research on the medicinal value and other value of cows, which, as you will know, are uh, considered sacred by caste Hindus. And you also hear stories about cows being provided with oximeters in a historical moment where people in hospitals don't have enough oxygen and oximeters. So there's something really odd going on here when the UK government cares more about statues, the Indian government cares more about cows, right? In quite a literal sense, these are sacred cows for both of these regimes. Um, and, you know, this is where I, I go back to, I think in a sense, uh, Du Bois's account of why those Confederate statues were built remains, I think, a really powerful, um, explanation for these for these artifacts and, and the kind of power with which they're invested. I mean, these are part of what he famously calls the, the public and the psychological wage that is paid to the, the, the white working class as, as it would now be called, um, to suture their racial alliance of whiteness and to obviate the formation of a class alliance. So I think, you know, these, these are ways in which the wages of whiteness, the wages of Hinduness, are being uh, dispersed by fascist regimes in these different locations as a way of obviating the formation of um, oppositional class and other alliances that might um, unseat and overthrow them. Thank you so much for that. Um, sorry, I'm just having a look. I know that Jasper has her hand up like right at the beginning. I don't know if there's a question there, but um, yeah. Um, oh, no, okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, another question from the chat is um, from Desmond again, asking about, um, which is something I'm curious about as well. Um, Jordi's essay, uh, Gender Trouble on Mother's Day, and what would, your, what would that essay look like for your first encounter with Marx? Um, I don't know if you have a response to that, Jordi. Uh, that is something I'm working on now. That's sort of the <laughs> behind the premise of the book. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a generous question. I don't know um, uh, 
how to quite answer it, um, but I guess maybe stay tuned. <laughs> um, I love, I love, but I, I'm not being very generous because I love to hear about everybody else's first encounters with like a, a you know, whatever, a, a life-changing book. Um, I don't know what an essay I would write would look like um, exactly. I guess um, this is a really roundabout way of answering it, but my, the answer that I've come to for myself around how, how to write about that encounter is that uh, I have to write about that encounter, not from my own perspective, but I, I, actually in a fully fictionalized way. Um, but I, I love to hear about everybody else's uh, first encounters with books. So it is a, it is a very nice question. Um, I think I should say, you know, um, I, yeah, actually, no, I was about to reveal something that, that didn't feel good to reveal <laughs> about the first time I got my hands on a book of marks. So, yeah, I'm going to just not answer the question any further. That's fine. <laughs> Rahul, do you have, like, an equivalent, like, writer or thinker that you, like, remember reading for the first time? Um, probably Edward Said. Um, and I remember thinking, I felt like he was the first theorist I understood. I understood what he was saying at some very deep level. I can't even remember which particular text it was. I don't think it was Orientalism. It might have been one of the essays. Um, but yeah, sorry, that's a very inarticulate response. But I think what I'm trying to say is that you know, there are some there are some writers who you read and you you know, I mean, one of the things that I find extraordinary about Jordi's essay about gender trouble, and I actually, when students of mine read gender trouble and have difficulty with the text and and come to me saying, I don't understand this, but I I think it's very important, and I think that somehow my liberation is wrapped up in an understanding of this text. I think that's a really, that's a really powerful and interesting reaction. And I think Jordi's essay gives, has given my students a deep reassurance that that's okay. Um, and I think that's a really, it's a really useful reading um, attitude to have, I think, with respect to many things. Um, and and you know that's why that that essay is is so special to me. Um, yeah. Um. Sorry, Georgia. Do you want to say something, or are you? I'm just thinking. Cool. Uh. Yeah. We've got another question in chat. Um. About the choice of form, picking up on Rahul's comment about the difficulty of establishing the genre of the confessions of the fox. Uh. Could you have presented these ideas as an academic monograph, and Rahul, could you have written it out of time as a novel? Uh, Jordi, do you want to go first? Um, at the time that I was writing it, I didn't feel like I could, I felt like I could uh, have presented it as, as an academic monograph, but I didn't, I thought it would be very depressing to do so. The, the issue, I think, was multifold at that time for me as the particular kind of scholar that I am. To go back to Mandeville, I was doing research on death penalty law in the early part of the 18th century and the debates that ended up really being bourgeois debates about, um, about propertization of Im imprisoned peoples um, and propertization of their bodies. And uh, Mandeville what, did make an argument that um, when the state executed people that that the state should take possession of the body again for scientific experimentation but really it was to um you know serve as a like extraordinary threat um and the threat of death you know just um um incredibly disrespectful treatment of someone's body um and was supposed to be like a quote unquote deterrent um, and then other other people would argue, you know, um, uh, that that in fact um, people people who were accused of um, crimes that carried a capital charge, and of course those crimes could be something like um, stealing a spoon or um, you know um, 
a sheep or something and um, should be transported to the colonies, you know, to do the work of, of dispossession as indentured labor there. So it was a very, it was a very depressing debate. And um, I just didn't have it in me to kind of explore this and its intersections with say sexuality um, from the perspective of an academic mon monograph. At the time, I would say that like utopian thinking in, 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 the, in the academy wasn't really um, at a high ebb. And so I guess I felt like uh, in order to take a, a slightly less depressing relation to this material, it would require a different kind of form that permitted kinds of speculation or it permitted us to kind of reinfuse that material with um, the kind of collective interests of ordinary people that you could see traces of in the archive, but might have a hard time making a case for um, uh, in a scholarly way. That makes sense. Thank you for the question. I'm interested in more interested in the novel of Out of Time. Um, I, I think I've often written along alongside literary texts without ever having any literary training myself. So in a very autodidactic sort of way, um, this probably began because it occurred to me probably from reading Said that the novel was the terrain on which post-colonial imaginaries were probably first being articulated in a non-derivative way. And so it was no accident that uh, post-colonial theory as a formation in the academy began in English and humanities departments before they made, before it made its way into, you know, the social sciences much later. So reading novels has sort of been an inescapable part of being a post-colonial theorist, quite apart from reading them for their own sake, of course, which I've always done. Um, in terms of the genre of out of time, I mean, I think, I think it's actually a fairly conventional academic monograph, except that I've been less interested in disciplines. Maybe it's not a very, it doesn't fit very easily into a discipline because I'm more interested in books that follow a question onto whatever disciplinary terrain it might lead, even at the risk of, um, coming up against barriers of competence or um, expertise. Um, I think that I'm, I'm interested in books that, um, you know, upend conventions of genre and refuse these kinds of disciplinary boundaries. Maybe another book I would mention in that vein is Avery Gordon's Ghostly Matters, which is um, quite hard to place and is, and is, you know, immensely powerful and moving for precisely that reason, I think. Um, and, you know, these kinds of books have, I think, given me permission to not be too worried about um, conventions of genre and discipline. Um, yeah, I think, sorry, just my own thoughts on that, are that I think it's really appropriate that you talked about the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, the whole, hi dog. Um, <laughs> Uh, in your work because I feel like that book is one of it's a novel but like I feel like it's advanced my political education more than almost any other novel I've read um, except obviously Johnny's book um, yeah sorry uh, I'm just gonna concentrate on the chat and stop burbling um, so Meg, hi Meg uh, has asked uh, Geordie's comments about bodily effluvia in Rahul's book is reminding me of the presence of effluvia throughout both Confessions of the Fox and the 18th century generally through plague, rudimentary surgery, so sewers, etc. Could either of you speak further on the parallels between your own work and our contemporary renewed awareness of effluvia and the role of the state in policing public health crises and medical care? I don't know which one of you would like to go first. Well, I could say something um, about the latter part of the question. Um, I mean, in the Indian context, the politics of effluvia has always been about the politics of caste, right? Caste is the category on the basis of which, um, you know, occupations like sanitation workers and cleaners have historically been um, 
performed by people belonging to subordinate castes. And so when we look at images of the pandemic now, and we look at images particularly of things like crematoria, which we've seen a lot of um, in, in the press, I think we have to think also about the people who work in those crematoria and the conditions under which they work at the un, under normal times. And the ways in which those the, the, the oppressiveness of those conditions is intensified, particularly in this moment, um, let alone their own kind of public, their own health and, and um, their, their own ability to cope with the pandemic. Um, I mean, all of these things are hugely narrowed by, by the contemporary crisis. Um, the Prime Minister famously launched a program called Swatch Bharat, which was about cleaning up the country. Um, and uh, predictably, this was completely oblivious to the politics of caste and to the way in which the country is kept clean on the basis of a caste system that has, um, you know, historically distributed the, the labor uh, of keeping things clean very, very unequally. Um, and so I, I would just say, I think, that caste is inescapable in thinking about how states and societies, at least this particular state and society, have managed the, the, the problem of effluvia and um, continue to do so or fail to do so. Um, <clears throat> I can't, there's, I, I mean, I, I can't really follow that up with much more. I guess it, just to say, I think though that um, you know, really needless to say, it seems that, you know, the question of what um, Alberto Toscano recently in historical materialism described as the need for dual biopower, right, this um, kind of what's become very clear is the need, the need for, um, you know, collective efforts to um, appropriate forms of social reproduction that have been presumed to be the purview of the state that the state we see will not do um, that. And obviously the history of the policing of collective attempts to do so from the Black Panthers, the young lords, the policing of those efforts of the young lords takeover of, of Lincoln Hospital, for example, um, or even I guess Dean Spade at the at the and in the in the introduction to the, his new mutual aid book talks about um, collective efforts at um, sort of uh, creating forms of public health um, uh, uh, sort of provisioning in Hong Kong during the outset of the pandemic. I mean, one of the things that I regretted the minute the pandemic broke out really um, among the many things I regretted, but um, was realizing that I really missed an opportunity in the writing of the book to think about forms, what did ordinary people do um, we know that the state used these pandemics and the threats of the pandemics to institute and naturalize forms of surveillance and policing, but what did ordinary people do um, during the plagues and threats of plague um, and what kinds of collective, say, um, you know, people's medicine developed? And I, you know, I kind of speculated the idea that testosterone could have been derived in a kind of, um, um, you know, fugitive manner, but, um, I, I, I didn't research at all, um, you know, forms of, uh, say, people's science um, in response to plagues in this period. So um, I think that's the really um, kind of main message, I think, that comes out. And I, I do think Alberto pretty well described this, the thing that maybe we want to be striving for as a revolutionary movement of forms of dual biopower, um, which I maybe, maybe prefer to the concept of mutual aid or, or it has a kind of specificity um, and a will to winning um, that I like. Thank you, Jordi. Um, and then this is maybe our last, oh, Mikey. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, Francis uh, has a question which, uh, I'm just sorry, flipping through Mikey's questions. Okay. Um, so Francis asked 
if maybe Jordy, you could speak about the relationship between testosterone and commodity form uh, in Confessions of the Fox. The strength elixir and Pequod's testosterone suggests the complexity and complicity of using the subject, sub, sorry, substance, and the problem of a community being mined and having their identity sold back to them. I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, well, the question says it better. I mean, says basically what I would have said. And um, I guess I only would just add again that um, I think the, the, the book was really motivated in, in a lot of ways in trying to think about, um, again, the relationship between policing and, and the commodity form. So um, I was really influenced, I'm sure it's obvious enough from the book, by um, the historian Ethan Blue's work on these testosterone experiments that were going on in San Quentin in the 1920s. And the book was in many ways like a um, effort to um, anachronistically cat project those backward um, onto an 18th century scenario. Um, these, you know, where the so-called prison doctor was um, using extracted material from executed prisoners to um, um, test um, testosterone grafting um, onto uh, prisoners with life sentences. This, of course, um, was not the first time this kind of thing had been done. And as we know from the 18th century, um, smallpox vaccines, of course, were tested on prisoners at Newgate and of course, stolen from uh, Turk Turkish uh, sort of medicine and brought back to Britain and then tested on prisoners. So. Um, really, I mean, we live in, in the in the non the ongoing apocalypse of, of all of it. Um, but yeah, so that's the answer to that question. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, this is probably going to be our final question. I'm sorry for running over. Well, slightly. Um, so Mikey asks, uh, Rahul mentioned Jack's ability to hear the stories that commodities want to tell. Confessions is full of bodies, objects, substances, archives, genres, all undergoing commodification, yet many sharing a resistance to intelligibility. I'm thinking of Voss's refusal to describe Jack's body to the pharma company and the hilariously sharp commentary on coffee. Um, body substances becoming archives is also a huge theme in years and years. Um, so could you speak about objects' ability to speak and the limits of this? Is there a promising state of becoming beyond the separation between bodies and things? Or is all doomed to become capital? That feels like an appropriate question to end on. I don't know if uh, Georgie would like to respond and maybe Rahul, if you have anything to say as well, if you're welcome to come in. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel, you know, I, I feel like I'm probably a broken record because a lot of this, I'm sorry, is in the book. So um, I apologize for repeating myself um, for years, I guess, but, um, uh, you know, the, the work on the commodity form, um, I'm not really satisfied with that, wh wherever I got to in the book, I'm not really satisfied with, uh, it, uh, where I started was the, um, you know, really great treatment of the question, um, in Fred Moten's In the Break, where he, um, is kind of takes, takes issue with, um, Marx's question, um, if the commodity could speak, what would it say? And, and Moten points out uh, very um, rightfully that um, people who were commoditized did speak, or in the case of his analysis, um, he also wants to um, read screaming as a form of speech. So, I mean, I think really a lot of the speaking of the commodities that, that I was um, doing in the book was sort of indebted to this um, kind of, again, that Marx is counterfactual if commodities could speak is not a counterfactual. And so I kind of just wanted to generalize the correction um, in a kind of speculative fiction sort of way. Um, I don't know about the future, but I think, um, <laughs> you know, uh, well, um, part of the book was about um, relationships between revolutionaries and the importance of the question of what sustains us when we need to hold on to a vision of a future that is different that we might not see but how important it is to be able to to be able to share that intimately um, with with someone else with a collective um, you know um, 
So I'll say that. I'll wrap it yeah, we need, I mean, we need that so much. I, I, I think one of the things that struck me about several moments in your responses, Jordi, were, was the question of anachronism, which is also something you brought up just at the end, um, at the way you play around with time, at the way in which you project things that happen in one moment onto another. Um, and this, this is one of the things that I found so intriguing and playful and compelling about the book. Um, it reminded me a little bit of Hilary Mantel's characters, who are, of course, in Tudor England, but sometimes sound like they're texting each other. And um, I've begun to think that it's not so much the characters, it's more that we as readers are hungry for these characters to speak to us. And so a lot of the, the connection is coming as much from the reading act as from what the characters are saying. And it's this hunger for, I don't want to say ancestors, but pre precursors or something in the past that speaks to the future. I think that really intrigues me. Um, it's as if we, you know, just to return to this question of revolutionary jouissance, we get some of it from reaching into the past and convincing ourselves that it was there, it is there, and it can be found, it can be tapped in. It's like this sort of reservoir in the ground that if we could only reach um, you know, we would we would derive draw some nourishment out of, and and that this is what keeps us going, maybe. Um, and so I think the play with time is really central to the production of this revolutionary jouissance that um, that I've been thinking about. Um, sorry, Jordi. Did you... No, I just said that's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, it's really beautiful. It's a really beautiful moment. To... Um, sadly draw this to a close. I just want to say a massive thank you to Georgie and Rahul um, for just like such a, yeah, stunning conversation and um, for bringing us, bringing kind of like the the darkness of like what is happening literally this moment in India and in Palestine and, you know, the kind of moments of joy that we've seen in Glasgow and um, kind of bringing together like this sense of um I don't know queer time and like things are happening in ways that aren't always totally linear and that leave space for hope I think um that we all really need right now um so thank you so much for that I'm just going to hand over quickly to Desmond I think who's going to plug a queer cultures thing that's going on yeah, thank you. And just to echo that, enormous thanks to both for an absolutely stunning conversation. Thoroughly enjoyed every minute of that. Um, I'll just say this really quickly because I know everyone's got a Friday night to go and enjoy that we've got a very um, humble uh, graduate symposium happening on the 11th of June, which features a keynote from Caroline Gonda, which um, everyone will be very welcome to attend. And you can find out more just by looking on our Twitter. I'm sure we'll tweet about it near the time. Um, I'll hand back to you, Saskia, to finish things off. So. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to quickly plug our next event as well, which is a, a book launch for um, Gaminda Bambra and John Holmwood's uh, book, Colonialism and Modern Social Theory, which will be on Wednesday, June 16th, uh, between 2 and 4 p.m. UK time. Um, and there's an Eventbrite, uh, which I'm just going to post again in the chat. Um, and that is not the link anyway I'll do that in a sec um and yeah so I just want to say again um thank you so much to uh my co-organizers uh Gaminda from uh BSA PDT study group and to Nisha and Desmond from Queer Cultures for letting me totally hijack them into uh creating this event with me um Rahul said at the beginning but he was a bit nervous and like I have been so nervous for the upstairs because basically this is just like my own little mad brain child that I said to Nisha one day and then decided to email everyone and make it happen so uh thank you Georgie and Rahul again so much for um agreeing to come along I really appreciate it um and yeah uh thank you so much to everyone for coming and asking such lovely questions thank you thanks so much thanks thanks a lot Thank you.